cleanse my guilt and pride. Blood of Christ the Unleavened Bread Ministries presents from your hands your feet Unleavened will Bread Bible Studies with Jesus David Eels. What can quench my thirsting soul? Purest water made me whole. Let your streams of mercy flow. Well, greetings, saints. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Unleavened Bread Bible Study. We've been studying um, the Order of Melchizedek. And I figured I would just go right on and um, look at a few more things concerning that. First, let's pray and ask the Lord's grace. Lord, we, uh, we love you. We appreciate so much your presence. We ask, Lord, for your guidance daily. We ask that your anointing be with us today. We ask that you, gave, you give great understanding to your people in these days uh, to know the wondrous things that you're about to do. Oh, Lord, uh, we're just so grateful, every one of us, to be used of you. It uh, completes our joy, Lord. And uh, we ask, Lord, that we might be given the gift to be well-pleasing to you in all things, Lord. It's by your grace we put our trust in you. And we give thanks unto you for that gift through Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Father. Well, I think I'll um, reread um, one thing that we read here in Hebrews chapter 6. And verse 17 wherein God, being minded to show more abundantly unto the heirs the promise of the promise, the immutability, that is the unchangeableness, of his counsel, interposed with an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have a strong encouragement who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us which we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and entering into that which is within the veil, whether as a forerunner Jesus entered for us, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So praise the Lord. Jesus entered in for us. Uh, being a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He entered within the veil. We discovered um, in chapter 10 that that veil was Jesus' flesh. You know how you have to part a veil in order to go through and into the holy place here, the holy of holies, which is one of the holy places in the, in the tabernacle. And it was also the presence of God you know, when you went through that veil, you went into the presence of God. So we're told in Hebrews 10 and verse 18, Now where remission of these is, there's no more offering of sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the way which he dedicated for us a new and a living way through the veil that is to say his flesh. And having a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with true heart in fullness of faith. So we see that in both texts, it is the faith um, that brings us through the veil and into the presence of God. And what makes that possible is, of course, the sacrifice of Jesus' flesh. Right? And I might say also, that because of the sacrifice of Jesus' flesh, we're able to sacrifice our own flesh. It is through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection being applied to our life that he's manifested in us. And, of course, we have to cooperate with him in this process. So, Jesus is a, the forerunner of those who walk by faith, and the first fruits of which in our day is going to be uh, also a part of this Melchizedek order. Because Jesus is, and he lives in them. 
And so entering into the veil is entering into the presence of God. Now, we're told in um, chapter 9 and verse 24, it says, For Christ entered not into a holy place made with hands, like in pattern to the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear before the face of God for us. So Jesus entered in, in a physical way, what we do in a spiritual way. He entered into the presence of God. He went through the veil, which was his own flesh. But in this case, he, he uh, entered into heaven itself. What does that, what, how does the heaven parable fit with the uh, tabernacle parable? Well, there's three heavens there, which mainly three heavens. Um, the heavens that we see above us and a part of this physical realm. And then there is a, um, a, uh, a dimension wall that goes into the second heaven, which is a spiritual realm. And the third heaven, which is also a spiritual realm. And the third heaven is, of course, the place of God's presence, which um, is a parable concerning the Holy of Holies. See, the first being the physical, the outer court being the physical, and then the uh, holy place being the soul, and then the holy of holies, also a holy place, which means the spirit. And so think about that when we read um, Hebrews 4 and 14. It says, Having then a great high priest who hath passed through the heavens. Ah, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Passing through the heavens. What did a high priest do to enter into the Holy of Holies? He had to pass through the outer court, the holy place, and then the Holy of Holies to enter into the presence of God. And we go from the physical to the soulish to the spiritual to enter into the presence of God too. We're growing in that way, right? So uh, when he passed through the heavens, he entered into the third heaven, which is the place of the presence of God, right? And so um, the heavens here represents what? That holy of holies, you see. Entering into the heavens represents the holy of holies. And you know, in Ephesians 1 and 3, the Bible says that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Entering into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies is a place where everything is supplied. Every need is supplied abundantly. And uh, in the days to come, God's people are going to enter in and they're going to have every need supplied. Uh, healing, deliverance, great time of miracles and signs and wonders. And uh, so it's, it's wonderful. But also Moses, remember we touched on this uh, last time, uh, God spoke unto Moses in Exodus 25. And uh, one thing he said to him was, now remember, Moses wasn't a high priest after the Levitical priesthood. And the Bible says the same thing about Melchizedek. He didn't come from the Levitical priesthood. And so, but Moses was before the Aaronic priesthood. And yet, listen to what he said to Moses in verse, chapter 25, verse 21. He says, And thou shalt put the mercy seat above and upon the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there will I meet with thee, speaking to Moses, he wasn't speaking to the Levites here. He wasn't speaking to their high priests. He was now speaking to Moses. And there will I meet with thee. I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. The mercy seat. Listen to that. From between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, and are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee, in commandment unto the children of Israel. So he was giving this to Moses, and Moses was to give this to the children of Israel, much like the man-child ministry will live in the presence of God and at the same time live in the presence of the people. 
They will live in the Holy of Holies, in the presence of God, and at the same time be on earth to minister to God's people. We're seeing something in the Spirit here that many people have taken in the letter and thought that the man-child ministry would fly away to heaven and never come back. But no, they live in heavenly places in Christ Jesus where all spiritual blessing has been given. And why was it given here in this text? Well, it was given in order for Moses to give it to the people. Did you know that Moses ministered from behind the veil? Remember the veil that was upon his face, which we just read in Hebrews, represents the flesh. And do you remember that Moses um, ministered to the people from behind the veil, but he was glorified behind that veil. The Lord lived in him, you know, and, uh, and yet he ministered to the people. He was in the presence of God. He was behind the veil, but he was ministering to the people. That's the kind of ministry that the man-child ministry, the Melchizedek order, is going to be. Jesus had that ministry. That's the kind of ministry he had. He was always in the presence of God. I do always those things I see of my Father, he said. You know, and as I hear, you know, I judge. He uh, always heard from the Father because he was in the Father's presence. So in the Spirit, he was in the presence of God. But in the flesh, he was before the people. Now that's what this is going to be, catching up to the throne. By the way, this is the throne here. Listen to what God said. I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. Ah. And from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Very interesting. And Hebrews 4 and 16 says this. Back in the same text we were looking at in Hebrews 4, he said, Let us therefore draw near with boldness unto the throne of grace that we may receive mercy there it is the mercy seat that we might receive mercy and may find grace to help us in time of need so Moses as the man child as the Melchizedek priesthood that wasn't reckoned of the later Levitical order um, was before the Lord and before the people. And as you know, he, when he came forth from that place, he had that veil on his face, and beneath that was that glorified man. The Lord lived in him, you know. And uh, I thought, last time I shared a piece from our book, uh, Hidden Manna, um, and I thought I'd share a couple of more pieces that were very, very interesting concerning this this particular thing. Some people think uh, they only see this in a letter, and again, they're thinking about something natural and when there's something spiritual about to happen. Uh, Jesus' ministry was amazing. It was astounding because it came straight from heaven. It didn't come from man. Uh, right now, we live under an old order anointing. Uh, in Jesus' day, the old order anointing was worse than this because at least we have the former reign now. But that's an old order anointing now. And we're coming to this new order anointing, uh, which is going to be passing through the veil into the presence of God. And uh, explaining this uh, can't be done in the natural. It has to be done in the spiritual. Uh, again, Moses, what Moses was, he was in spiritual man behind that veil of flesh. Right? And that's the way it's going to be this time. Let me read this to you. On May the 4th, 2000, Tom Nelson was used to give a prophecy of the experience of the first fruits being caught up to the heavenly throne while being a part of the true earthly spiritual third temple. Many of you are waiting for the third temple to be built. It's being built. They just can't see it. Um, here's the prophecy. Some are called forth to be caught up in the heavenlies. What did we just discover that was? To go through into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle what? The tabernacle of the wilderness. It wasn't the tabernacle in heaven. 
it's in heavenly places, true, but we discovered that heavenly places start here, right? So some are called forth to be caught up in the heavenlies, but still be here on the earth, there where you are, and there where I am too. And when I dwell within you, as well as among you. In other words, this is going to happen when the Lord comes to dwell in his people. See, just like Moses, you lift the veil, you look under there, there's a glorified man. His face shone, you see. The Lord was manifested in him, you see. Uh, there is a third heaven that you will taste. There's a third temple that you will see. You will see it in the sense that it becomes reality. But you will walk in it because you are a part of it. You know, the third temple, folks, is being built. It is people. It is not a building, okay? Uh, no other temple is God ever going to dwell in, and it will never be holy again. Well, I'm going to read on my, my interpretation here. It says, like the end-time church, like in the end-time church, Sarah, Rachel, Mary, Hannah, were all by nature incapable of bringing forth the man-child. Hannah prayed for a man-child in 1 Samuel 1, 11, and by grace brought him forth. In verse 22, she said, Until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. Oh, notice that, folks. Notice that when the man-child is weaned from the milk of the foundation word and gets on the meat, you know, which Jesus said was to do the will of the Father, he will abide forever before the Lord, even as he ministers upon the earth. Notice that. God's hidden so many wondrous things in his word. In like manner, the man-child Jesus said that he only did those things that he saw and heard of the Father because he was in the throne presence of the Father while on earth. John 5 and 19, Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father doing. For what things soever he doeth, these the Son also doeth in like manner. And verse 30, I can of myself do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Truly, Jesus was living in two places at once. In the spirit, he was totally connected to the throne of God, the mercy seat, as Moses was. And in the flesh, he was before the people. And uh, this is not only going, as we read on, I'm going to share with you how this is not only going to be the experience of the man-child, but also of the bride. So, in his first throne experience, I'll explain that in a minute, Jesus' spirit was seated with the Father, seeing and hearing him as he ruled on the earth. The first fruit overcomers will also do this. Revelation 3 and 21. He that overcometh, I will give to him to sit down with me in my throne. And I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. I want to say to you that I had a vision, and I shared that vision with you last teaching, and uh, how that I sat down with Jesus in his throne, and the throne wasn't up in heaven, folks. It was on the top of Mount Zion. It was in the spiritual heavenly Jerusalem. See, there's a kingdom here on this earth. It's in the spirit. It's not in the flesh anymore. In the Old Testament, it was fleshly. The, the Jews were literal letter Jews. They had a letter David and a letter Jerusalem, and none of that is true in the spirit. See, the Apostle Paul said, you are come to the heavenly Jerusalem. He called it the spirits of just men made perfect. The city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem. So, folks, we have. when you come to the kingdom of God, you are coming to this mountain. This is a mountain that we must climb to into the presence of God, which is on top. In my vision, that's what happened. I climbed this mountain, and on the top, there was the new Jerusalem. And in the new Jerusalem, there was Jesus on his throne, and I sat down with him. And 
other men tried to come into this place of authority, and Jesus said to me, don't worry about them. They can't come in here. That was what happened with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the uh, fakes of Jesus' day. They didn't enter into the authority, the throne authority, because they didn't come through the door. And that is, of course, coming through Christ, right, who is the door. So uh, let me read on a little bit more here. In the second throne experience, the soul also will be in the heavenlies and in the presence of God as Jesus was in type. The following is a revelation which confirms this spiritual nature of the first and second throne experience. Um, the protection afforded those who rule from the throne and the great authority given to the bride. What do I mean by a first and second throne experience? Well, just think about it. Think of Moses, who was a man-child in his day, who was the Melchizedek priesthood, as we saw, who entered into the veil, um, into the presence of God. Well, when Moses went up on the mountain of God, remember the Lord told him that he was on holy ground, and he told him to take his shoes off, he was in the holy presence of God. He was, in, in effect, beyond the veil and into the presence of God. And the Lord ordained him and anointed him to go back and bring Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness, which is our tribulation, and into the promised land. Okay. But when he got halfway through the wilderness is where he had that second experience of going up on the mountain of God and his face began to shine and he had to put the veil on his face so that the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 the children of Israel couldn't look steadfastly on that which was passing away. Well, what was passing away was Moses <laughs> and Moses represented the law. That was passing away too. So at any rate, this was a second stage here. You see, these throne experiences the man, Jesus had these two in type, you know, and passed them on to us. These, uh, these two throne experiences are also going to be true in the end times. And they are basically a perfecting of the first fruits, first in spirit and then in soul. This is before, by the way, a change in the body because Moses had the veil upon his face. And the Bible says that the veil is his flesh. See, so here's somebody who is perfected in spirit and soul, but walking in a fleshly body because the veil is still there. And they, per, they had to perceive Moses through that veil. They didn't understand that underneath that veil there was a, a matured son of God in, in type. Okay? So that's what I mean by the first and second, and I explain that much more carefully in our book, uh, Hidden Manor for the End Times. But let me read this. Uh, near the beginning of January of 1998, Pastor Stephen Shelley uh, was told by the Lord that within two weeks he would have the experience of a trance vision in which he would be carried away in the spirit. On Sunday, January the 18th of 98, he entered into a heavenly realm. Now, this was a teaching that God was giving him, much like the vision that I had of the same kind of a thing. So he entered into a heavenly realm at the end of the evening service. With his body on earth, he was taken to see the throne in the spirit. He was able to describe to those around him what the angel of the Lord was showing him and what he was seeing, hearing, and experiencing in the heavenlies. That's the same as with Jesus, right? Jesus was seeing the Father. He was seeing what the Father was doing. He was hearing the Father, but he was standing there before them. And, of course, he is a sign of the larger man-child ministry, which is repeated in our day. And he is also the one who lives in that man-child ministry of our day. And he gets all the credit. Well, like the coming uh, man-child bride, I'll explain that, uh, he was able to minister to the saints on earth while his spirit was in heavenly places. What do I mean by the man-child bride? Well, you remember uh, Mordecai in, um, in Esther, right? 
And Esther was the, the choosing of the bride for the king, right? It's, it's obvious that's a parable of the end times. Uh, well, Mordecai means, in Hebrew, a uh, little man. And in Persian, it means little boy. He represented the man-child, see? And uh, he trained up Esther. He sat in the king's gate. He was already in the presence of the king. But he trained up Esther to go uh, into the king's presence. Well, you know, when John saw Jesus with his disciples following him, he said, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. What was Jesus doing? He was training up those disciples to walk in the presence of God just as he was and to hear from God just as he did. And so um, let me read on a little bit here. The angel told him that soon many would walk in this place where only a few had previously stood. In the beginning, only a, f a few in our day are going to stand in that place. But then many are going to stand in that place, you see. Um, here are some excerpts from what he related with my notes in parenthesis. He said, we have been called to his throne room. It is at the top of the mountain across a wide spiritual river called the Great Divide. The throne of God, the throne room. Remember where we saw the throne was? It was between... The cherubim, right? The mercy seat, right? The throne of God, the throne room. His true presence is on top of Mount Zion, just as it was in the Old Testament, by the way, except we're talking about a physical Mount Zion, a physical people called a Jew. Now, if you're going to be a Jew in the New Testament, you have to be circumcised in heart and a spiritual Jew, right? And again, we still have our King David, Jesus, and so on and so forth. So the presence of God is on the top of Mount Zion. It, I, I might add also, in my vision, I climbed this mountain, and on the top there was a representation of the New Jerusalem. And I saw when I went through the door Jesus sitting on the throne, and I ran over there, and I sat down with Jesus, and I spoke to Jesus in my vision. And that's when these men were trying to come up another way. Also, uh, we could look at, um, I'll just read this real quickly. Revelation 14, let me read that to you. And I saw and behold the Lamb standing upon Mount Zion. This is not carnal Mount Zion. Um, read uh, Galatians chapter 4, you'll see that there are two Mount Zions. There is the physical Mount Zion, which is fallen and in um, degradation and the very Antichrist. And there is spiritual Mount Zion, which is holy. Okay, and um, it says, And I saw, and behold, a lamb standing upon Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. Name meaning nature, character, and authority. That's the renewed mind of Christ that we're speaking about here. And I heard a voice from heaven. Why does it say from heaven? Because they're not in what we would call physical heaven. You know, they are on the earth in heaven, you see. I heard a voice from heaven as a voice of many waters and the voice of a great thunder. And the voice which I heard was the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sing, as it were, a new song before the throne. There it is. And before the four living creatures and the elders, and no man could learn the song save the 144,000, even they that had been purchased out of the earth. These are they that were not defiled with women, meaning, of course, sects, denominations. Women are used that way in the Scriptures. Seven women shall take hold of one man in that day. Okay, so for they, talking about the seven churches, for they are virgins. These are they that follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Well, once again, these people are having the experience with God that Jesus was having with God when he was on the earth, you see. These that follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were purchased from among men to be the first fruits. This means bought and taken. These people are possessed by God. 
purchased from among men to be the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no lie. They are without blemish. They're speaking the truth that comes from the throne. They've entered in through the veil. They're speaking the truth, you see. So let me finish this revelation here. Um, so he said, we're going to the throne of God, the throne room. His true presence is on top of Mount Zion. He has taken his seat in the hearts of men, but his throne is a place of true victory. It is safe ground. When we stand before his throne, we are safe. No enemy has any right or authority over us when we stand before his throne. Remember Jesus' exhortation. He said, no man takes my life. And they tried a few times, and they failed. It wasn't until he gave it up that they were able to do that. Well, that's the same experience that's going to be afforded to the first fruits. His angel has taken his presence to God's people. And when we stand at his throne, it will not be in his presence, but the presence that has gone before him. In other words, you could be in the midst of his presence and him not be standing there, but his angel has brought his presence. Well, that's interesting, folks. I don't know if he knew this or not, but that's exactly scriptural. Um, this is true. Moses, his first throne experience, it was the angel of the Lord who spoke to him with the voice of the Lord out of the burning bush. According to Stephen in Acts 7, 35 and 38, he was called in Isaiah 63 and 9, the angel of his presence. Then um, Stephen goes on to speak. He says, he is calling his bride to stand before his throne and receive her promise. That's right. Through the man child, through Mordecai, the bride was brought into the presence of the Lord, you see. And once again, this is the same thing. Uh, Jesus also led the bride into the presence of the Lord. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. And once again, Jesus is going to do that. He's going to do it in a larger corporate body upon the earth. The angel says, Tell my people to prepare their hearts to stand in the throne room of God. We must move beyond the power of God to his presence in order to be like God. Every answer to every question lies just inside the throne room. Well, it was true. I mean, they couldn't stump Jesus. They had a question. He had an answer, but they didn't come from him. He said, as I hear, I judge. Right? Well, the sure knowledge of the truth of Jesus will be given to these people. Stephen went on to say, he said, somebody has to go to help us. Then, when we have learned the way... Remember what Jesus said? I'm the way. You want to go into the presence of the Father? I'm the way. Well, once again, God is going to show us the way. Okay. Um, he said, then when we have learned the way, the bride will have access to stand in God's throne room. See? The man-child is going first, just like Joseph, you know. And then the bride. Remember, Joseph went in and... Um, went through much turmoil in order to receive the authority of the kingdom, right? <clears throat> Whenever she's in need, God's knowledge will be her knowledge. His wisdom will be her wisdom. Wow, praise God. You know, when the uh, anointing came upon um, the bride in Jesus' day, the, the New Testament was written. Did you know that? Um the bride were those disciples who followed Jesus in the beginning. And uh, the anointing that came upon them was so perfect that they wrote the New Testament in a perfect numeric pattern, just exactly as the prophets did in the Old Testament. That tells you the kind of anointing that even the former reign was. What about the latter reign, which the Bible tells you is greater? Hmm. The kingdom will be at her command, even as it has been at my command. She will speak, and the host of heaven will carry out her request. For it is in my throne room that my favor will be shown to her. And of course, that throne room is what? 
beyond the veil, which Jesus made opportunity for us. When his flesh was rent, that veil was rent. Why? To symbolize the fact that now we can enter into that holy of holies, right? She leads when she steps from that place, like Esther, too. You know? She will never again question who she is, nor why she has been sent. For I will reveal to her all that she has need of. For the time is near, saith God. You remember what Jesus said, As the Father sent me, so send I you. And he breathed on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Did they not? Well, that anointing is about to be poured forth once again. The man child's going first into the presence of God. His ministry will be to bring that to the disciples. And as Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. And they went forth, too, and they were called Christians by the pagans, right? Well, Pastor uh, Shelley received a second vision on July the 19th. Here is a portion of what he related in that same manner as before. The angel said, it's not who is worthy, but who is chosen. So true. And he's crying here. Uh, we're not worthy. We're just chosen. Spiritually, the bride will soon be given access to the heavenly realm. Not naturally to visit, but spiritually she will visit. In other words, she will visit in spirit the heavenly realm. Okay. Um, she will be then given strength, wisdom, and learn of his character for the final work that she has, is called to do. You remember in Esther, folks, the bride was the one that saved the rest of God's people because she had access to God represented by her husband there, the king. She must be trained in heavenly realms for the final work. So he is calling her to come and to stand even before his throne. Realms of glory that we have never known. We will then receive power to cast out even the strongest demons, to break even the strongest chains, to set even the most captive lives free. Wow, that's, that's great, isn't it? Praise God. Trained by the Spirit before the throne. Jesus said, as I see of my father as I hear of my father you know uh, I am seeing what is happening in heaven now not beyond the curtain of time when we are all gathered there the angel says remember this time you will see but next time you will receive revelation to teach others how to stand in these realms see that's that's the ministry of the man child when he teaches the bride Remember that Jesus made opportunity for all of us by faith to enter into his presence and to live in his presence. This is the experience that God has saved for these days. He saved the best wine for last. He said so, right? Uh, they are speaking to each other in strange language, he says. He said to me, we speak here with the tongues of men and the tongues of angels. So it is when men are filled with God's spirit. They too speak with tongues of men and tongues of angels. And he, Stephen says, angels are worshiping. They're saying, holy, holy, holy. And um, to the right side of the throne, he stands. His feet, even from where I'm standing, I see, as we've heard, are like brass, like gold tried in a furnace. I see his robe, soft and white. Even from a distance, I see his waist is girded about with a golden rope. The cloud covers, mist covers his face. O oh Lord, I shall never be the same. That was Stephen Shelley's comment there concerning his experience of seeing heavenly places in Christ. While still in the vision, Pastor Shelley prophesied. Here are portions of that prophecy. He said, I will catch her away into heavenly realms in my spirit, into deeper anointing. Yea, she will taste the water from the river of the live, living God. She will feel it as it flows across her, says the Lord. Prepare thy heart, 
for you are about to step in, even as a body, to the greatest hour of deliverance that thou hast ever known. Soon you will see blind eyes opened. The lame shall be raised to walk. Cancer will be healed. Tumors shall fall off. Yea, even the miracles that thou hast heard about, the things that thou hast heard that I have done, I will surely do even in your midst, for I will deliver even the ones who seem the most bound. That's the ministry of Jesus, right? Now, don't we long to see that? Well, that's what's coming, the ministry of Jesus. He's coming in his people, just as we read it in the first prophecy. He's coming in his people to do these things. My children, walk softly before me and seek my face as never before, even as I am seeking after thee. Pray and call upon my name. I will meet you in your place of prayer. I will meet you at your fasting, and I will meet you at the place of your dedication, and I will call you even as I have called my servant. My children, I'm able to show you that which I have prepared for you, that I might help you to be ready. For that which is about to take place, even the final and the greatest harvest. Yes, amen. For I say unto you, the struggling deliverances that you have known, you will not always know. By the power of my spoken word, I will manifest instant miracles and instant deliverances. For the glory of the latter will be surely, will surely outshine the former, says the living God. Wow. Well, aren't you looking forward to that Melchizedek priesthood being manifested on the earth? Meaning, of course, Jesus himself is coming um, to do his wondrous work, right? I have one more thing I want to share with you here. Um, this is a revelation that was just given to us uh, by Brad Moyers, and I've given some interpretation to it, but he said, I dreamt there were a bunch of us believers gathered in a hallway of what felt like my old high school. There were even lockers built into the walls. Everybody was talking and enjoying one another's company. Uh, David was greeting and hugging everyone. He was very jovial. He hugged me two or three times. And what was strange was his eyes were so bloodshot. Um, this, how do you sp spell it? Sclerare, uh, you know, the white of the eyes, were all red. Also, the orbits of his eyes all the way around were a deep red. And I got the feeling that his eyes looked this way from a lot of crying or rubbing. And everyone noticed this but didn't ask him about it. And it came to me the next day that the red was the blood of Christ. Well, you know, we have to have our, our senses exercised by the Word of God, not washed in the blood, you know. Um, when we cry, our eyes are washed with water, uh, which in this case represents the Word of God. We, we've got to see the way God tells us to see. Washing with the Word represents being able to see the way God gives us to see. That is a gift that we're about to receive here. Uh, the word is what brings the cleansing blood. Jesus' first sign was at a wedding feast, which represents the end time seven day wedding feast that the man child officiates over. There the water uh, in six clay water pots representing the body of the true people of God was turned into wine, which represents the blood of Jesus in the Lord's Supper. In other words, and the life of the flesh is in the blood, so we know that that blood represents the nature of Jesus in his people, right? Uh, having eyes washed in the blood is to have them see as God sees. In 2 Peter 1 and 2, we're told, Grace to you and peace be multiplied in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power hath granted unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us by his own glory and virtue. So we have to be seeing this, that his divine power has already given this to us, right? This is how we enter in through the veil, right? 
whereby he has granted unto us his precious and exceeding great promises, that through these you may become partakers of the divine nature. Praise God. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world by lust. That's what we want to do. We want to enter into his presence, escape the carnal nature, and uh, have his divine nature. Seeing this way is the key to deliverance from corruption and receiving what we need of God's nature and power, which is what the blood represents. And in 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, we behold in a mirror the glory of the Lord and are transformed into that same image from glory to glory. So we, we see that we have already come to our perfection, our maturity. We see that that was already given to us through Christ, right? And then uh, Brad's revelation goes on. He says, the reason we were all hanging out was because we were waiting for the bride, the, excuse me, the Bible study to start. This particular study was going to be different and had everyone particularly excited because David was going to be broadcasting from a plane. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Elijah knew these people were standing out. They knew something was about to happen. I knew something was about to happen. They knew something. I believe I represented and they represented a larger body of people out there. Okay. But we knew something was going to happen. Did you, you remember the story of Elijah? How that he knew what was about to take place. And not only that, Elisha, you know, the disciple, he knew what was about to take place too because the sons of the prophets asked him, did you know that your Lord was going to be taken from you today? And he was in a chariot, right? Okay. So there, everybody's knowing that this is about to happen. What does this broadcasting from a plane represent? Well, I think it represents a, a different heavenly anointing that uh, we're excitingly, excitedly expecting and to be to be speaking from a heavenly position, you see. It was going to be a small one, like a two-seater. Well, yeah. <laughs> you remember when Moses came, was sent back to Israel, and uh, Aaron was his speaker, and God said to Moses, you will be to him as God, and he will speak for you, right? He will be your prophet. Well, that's the way it is in the end time. It's Jesus who is going to be the one speaking through the man-child. It's a two-seater plane, right? Um, just like Moses spoke through Aaron, Jesus is going to be speaking through the man-child. Um, but he said it was going to be a small one, a two-seater, but he was hanging out with us for a few minutes while he waited for the plane to arrive. And in the dream, I wasn't sure why David was going to be broadcasting from a small plane. But I didn't think about it much because I was enjoying David, David's and the other's company too much to care. Well, David here, I believe, represents the first fruits end time um, corporate man child, David, in whom Jesus lives through his anointed word. This is what's about to happen. Uh, the plane is overcoming the world. The throne of God, the heavenly anointing of the latter rain that will be given to them, first as the former rain uh, was given through Jesus Christ, right? Um, and the word preached from an airplane, uh, which, quote, comes down out of heaven. Remember, Jesus was the word that came down out of heaven. He was the manna that came down out of heaven. So the word preached from an airplane which comes down out of heaven is what breaks the yoke and sets the captives free. Um, Jesus, as, as the man-child, was a type of this end-time repetition of history. I call it his story, right? It's a repeat of his story, right? Uh, when he said things like John 14 and 24, The word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So in other words, Jesus spoke as a representative of heaven. He heard what the Father said, and he repeated what the Father said. And he did what he saw the Father doing, right? 
and John 6, 63. It's the spirit that giveth life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken unto you are spirit and they are life. And they were straight from the throne of God. And, of course, they had the effect of coming straight from the throne of God. Right? This anointing will bring, will begin, excuse me, with the first fruits, but will spread throughout the true body of Jesus before his natural coming. Just as the former rain was first received by Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, and he taught the disciples or the bride uh, for three and a half years, and um, then that anointing was poured out upon them. It was called the former rain. So it will be this time. The anointing will first come, of the latter rain will first come. Uh, that throne room presence will first come to um, the man child ministry. And then, as they are training the bride for the first three and a half years, that will be poured out. The latter rain will be poured out on the bridal company and the disciples of Christ. You know, um, the Bible teaches that the Lord is coming in his people through an epiphany. He's coming to, be, uh, to shine forth from his people. Um, and the man-child will be the first to partake of this. The man-child company will be the, the David man-child company will be the first to partake of this anointing and will turn and share the teaching that comes from that anointing with the disciples who will, like in Jesus' day, uh, go forth two by two to bring it to others and it will continually spread and spread and spread like a geometric progression all over the globe to all of the elect of God. We've got a, uh, a marvelous revival ahead. It's going to spread so fast that the gospel is going to be preached in all of the world. That's never happened before. And the Bible tells us that in Matthew 24 that's going to happen in these days, folks. So praise God. Why is it going to happen so quickly when it's failed for 2,000 years to happen? It's because of the restoration of Christ's ministry in the earth. Uh, through the man-child ministry and the restoration of the latter rain. The latter rain is going to bring a great restoration to the people of God. The signs and the wonders and the miracles that we read about, you know, that Stephen saw there, that's exactly what the scriptures are prophesying is coming in this latter rain, a great outpouring of God's Spirit. Many of you out there are waiting on God to answer your prayers, your spoken words of faith uh, the Lord is going to do that just as when Jesus came there was a great revival and multitudes of people who had been waiting upon him waiting upon God received their miracles received their deliverances there was a great revival in the midst of much persecution from the Pharisees and the status quo group you know and uh, the big temple and uh, Jesus out there sitting on the rock with his disciples right once again, we're going to see uh, a simple street movement, not in the big temples, but a street movement, but a very moving movement, a uh, great revival, and a great healing, deliverance, salvation revival. It's a real revival. We've already seen um, Moses' um, fakes that came before Moses, you know, the Janus and Jambres who... Uh, came to uh, try to copy the miracles of Moses. We've already seen that. And, uh, but Moses' um, staff, which became a serpent, and swallowed up uh, Pharaoh's magician's staff. That's about to happen, too. So the great power of God is going to overwhelm the fakery that's going on out there, folks. Uh, praise be to God. You know, it's going to show it up right away. Again, these people are going to have this blood-washed eyesight. They're going to see right through the fakery. They're going to see right through the so-called leaders of Christianity, which were like the leaders in Jesus' day when he said, you are of your father the devil, because it's his will that you wish to do. You know, there is, there is nothing different about our day than Jesus' day. It's just a larger repetition 
on a larger scale. Uh, but if you, when you read the Gospels in the book of Acts, remember that's what's going to happen in these days. We're going to have our own book of Acts here <laughs> by the grace of God, God moving through his people, an epiphany in his people to bring forth this great salvation to, to the whole world. You know, glory be to God. It's going to be manifested in the earth worldwide. No, the whole world is not going to receive it, but it's going to be in the whole world. And um, <clears throat> no, there's still going to be a narrow road and a broad road, right? It'll still be that way. But I believe a higher percentage of planet Earth is going to come into the kingdom. And I believe the people that we've prayed for for years, just like the people we've prayed for for healings for years, and we've stood in our faith and held steadfast when we didn't see an instant miracle, and uh, gradually we see these miracles. Well, those are going to be sudden and quick in the coming days. And in the same way, the people that we've prayed for to come into the kingdom are going to come in sudden and quick in these days. And they may have been stumbling around out there in darkness for many years, but uh, God is going to bring them into the kingdom. Praise God. We're going to see a great revival and also a great falling away. And uh, as you know, that in Jesus' day, there was a falling away of the status quo, you know, bunch, the, uh, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the people that followed them of uh, all the apostate denominations, there was a great falling away. And we're going to see that too, but a great revival. And people who walk in the presence of God uh, while they're still on the earth. You know, most of the apostate church doesn't believe, they believe that's heresy, you know. Sadly, they just aren't studying the Word of God to see what a great opportunity this is. I mean, and the fact that God promised a former and a latter rain on the morning of the third day, which is where we are now. So this, this great revival is about to spring forth whether they believe it or not. Glory to God. God bless you. We'll do this again sometime. Amen. For more information and materials, go to www.unleavenedbreadministries.org.